Hi, I'm going to talk about All Man Out today. Uh, this is the Laurie Green's novel that was published 75 years ago this month in March 1945. Not as much about the film, though clearly, because Green was involved in the screenplay for the film as well, there's uh, quite an interesting mixture here because I think partly there are cues in the film that a Belfast audience will get from elements of the novel that maybe would be lost on a wider general audience. And secondly, because there's a, a concern that you can see in shifts between the, the novel and screenplay that the author that Laurie Green had for historical authenticity. And I think a lot of this is maybe underappreciated in that uh, there's so much more emphasis placed on the film um, rather than the novel itself. Um, oh man, I, so, oh, I mean, it's often only thought of as the film, and, and like Cyril Cusick, who's in the film, called it uh, a good film made from a bad book. But um, it, it's the changes between the novel and the film, I think, that are really revealing. Laurie Green reputedly chastised his contemporaries in the Belfast arts community that um, I'm writing about what you and your friends should be writing about in the dramas that are going on here, and your people are ignoring what is on in your own doorstep. And I, I think this is mm, this is much more explicit in the novel um, than it is in the film. But I, I think Green clearly was writing for a and and if you take the Reed's Carol Reed's film, there's a whole series of audiences for both of these. And I think that the local one, the kind of Belfast one that might have taken a whole series of different elements out of both, um, has been often overlooked in all of this. One obvious set of cues for Belfast audiences in geographical information, though I, I think this is quite significant and this is a, a kind of a big component of elements that are placed into the novel in particular, that of course carry forward into the film, but that a Belfast audience particular would see. Um, there's uh, After the robbery that's quite early on in the film, the getaway route through the, is described in the novel as Royal Avenue, Donegal Place and the Donegal Square, past City Hall towards Dublin Road. And then when Agnes, or in the film Kathleen, goes looking for Johnny, she goes past Central Library and Belfast Telegraph to York Street. And clearly what we're, we're talking about the area here beyond um, uh, in York Street and in, in, in the Sailor Town, um, because Maud and Rosie, characters in the film and the novel, they live near Corporation Street. And that's where Johnny encounters Jim, who's Jimmy Prescott there. And he leaves him at a bar, the Four Winds, which is in Sailor Town. It's, this, this is all really a, a, a big component of the setting is that area of Belfast and Sailor Town, York Street, North Queen Street, that general area. Now, I think that if you take Johnny's overall journey, I mean, this is, uh, I, I think this isn't accidental. And I think that idea of a journey that's kind of explicit in a lot of kind of fiction and other kind of literary works of the period. And um, Johnny starts in a safe house in the Falls Road, and then each step takes him further from safety you know in that sense and i mean obviously the first is the robbery then he's left out on the streets in that area um he ends up in rosie and maud's house and obviously because uh, johnny is an ira leader they're protestant women living in what's kind of presented as a sort of protestant district um that this is you know he's progressively getting further into danger next when jimmy prescott picks him up he's described as being a gunman from the troubled times again that I know may not the, the kind of opposite of Johnny or the mirror image of Johnny on the other side of the political spectrum. And he leaves him at a pub in the Four Winds. And this is, you know, Johnny basically being carried into the kind of, you know, through different levels of danger and getting progressively more dangerous. Um, and I think people who would, particularly a Belfast audience that would spot the cues, would understand where that's going. And of course, what they would all have implicitly known and would have most of them would have remembered, obviously you'd be very familiar with, is that the docks in Sailor Town area was very much the focus of, of violence in 1935 when there was serious rat and a lot of people burnt out of their homes and there were uh, 
a number of fatalities over a prolonged period of time that summer. Um, and there was a, the district that was curfewed was this district that's marked out on the map here. There's a couple of different stages of the curfew. And this is the area in which the film unfolds, really. Um, and even there's a at one point, there's a reference to uh, the square near the area where Kathleen or Agnes is going to visit a uh, priest. And which is clearly referencing St. Joseph's down in Sailor Town and Corporation Square would appear to be the square that gets mentioned as well. So I think a Belfast audience would understand all of these cues and in a way that audience from outside Belfast or general audience wouldn't. And of course, for many of the people who read it, they would know as well that I mean this was what was described as the storm centre of violence in 1920-22. And Belfast itself saw maybe 20-25% of fatalities in the War of Independence and in the period between say uh, 1920 and uh, June of 1922 and a significant proportion of those are actually in Sailor Town. Um, while Laurie Green himself uh, was born in England, um, I mean his, his ancestry actually is kind of from Cork um, going further back in Ireland. But uh, Green had been resident in Belfast since 1933. So Green obviously would have been familiar with um, particularly the 1935 rats. And I think there's a hint as well and that, you know, that this, there are children that feature in key scenes in the film. And I think that this is, uh, whether it's conscious or subconscious, this mirrors, there's this, in the, the, particularly the photojournalism from the 1935 rats, there's a lot of juxtaposition of children in violent contexts. Now, I mean, in some cases, like, I mean, this famous photograph on Lancaster Street, York Street, the boy in front of Sheridan's bar, which is wrecked, which is kind of one of the sort of sparks that set off the violence on the day. You get this recurring in a number of different uh, contexts of like, you get uh, children in front of houses that have been burnt out or in streets where houses have been burnt out and you can see I mean like the two the photographs in the center here and, and these are I mean these children may well have witnessed houses being burnt out they may have known the people who are burnt out of the houses or whatever but there's a, an awareness of the children of the kind of violent context uh, and in their area and the two photographs of the boys here, the one on the right, the boy with his kind of elbow raised towards the camera. The photographer noted that he's particularly agitated and that there is and clearly the implication is that the boy has witnessed a lot of the violence that um, has occurred in the area in the time before the photograph was taken. I mean, you can see the photograph of the boy on the left, the one's looking at the camera and, and he, I mean, again, looking at the, the actual body language and the boy's face clearly he too has witnessed quite a lot in that period and i think this that this occurs in the this, this the devices in the novel and the film i mean many people know they know the kids from belfast that were used in the making of the film but i think that this is a this is seen as a device that's uh, particularly in the film that it's kind of quite explicit but uh, i think that i think that this is kind of this is alluding to that photojournalism from 1935 and possibly there's a comment there on kind of you know the perpetuation of violence but i mean it's not as i say it's not overly explicit but i just think it's kind of um it's quite interesting in terms of where green locates most of the action of the film now the funny thing is when he goes through this journey that Johnny goes through from the safe house uh, to the Four Winds Bar, um, that like the next stage of his descent into kind of his own personal hell, kind of through this journey, is he actually ends up in hands of the Belfast Arts community, which is the Griffin Lukey characters. Now these are the people the Green had mentioned that you're ignoring what is going on on your doorstep, own doorstep. Um, like Griffin is a, a caricature of John Hewitt. I mean, not a particularly satirical or biting one, but I mean, it is intended. I mean, I think Green is ribbing John Hewitt, and he, he, I don't think relationships between the two of them were that particularly bad. 
that it's intended to be anything more than really playful. But I think that the other characters as well are composites of various people in the art scene that Green is familiar with. And so there is a kind of, you know, the, a lot of there's a there is a Belfast literary scene at the time, and they would have been conscious of things like the structure of a novel and the kind of devices being used. And so I don't think that this would be lost on them, that sort of Johnny's journey from safety and the danger that the next level of that beyond going from being an IRA leader in the falls to being, you know, in a kind of marooned in a bar in the most dangerous district in Belfast for kind of unionist gunmen or whatever, is that the place worse than that is being in the hands of the Belfast arts community. Now, Green began writing the novel around October 1943, and he'd produced a full type script by August 1944. Um, and as I said, I mean, I've seen the novels published in March 1945. Um, over the next period of time, until like 19, February 1946, when filming began, is when Green wrote the novel, or Green, well, Green was involved in the screenplay. And I think that this kind of helps us understand the historical context and the shifts in historical context uh, this timeline sort of for looking at Green's concern about historical authenticity. When the novel came out, um, it received you know, some reasonably good reviews. You know, I mean, it's uh, it's called like a novelized playboy of the Western world or Northeastern world um, in the Irish Independent. Um, but uh, and, and though that does say, I mean, it's that Green's novel was in a way of a higher order. Um, and, and that's the study of the thoughts, efforts and final struggle of Johnny in the hours when he realised death was approaching. And the Belfast Newsletter Review um, kind of, you know, suggested um, that it is Green's best novel to date. And, and it may yet supply that lack in our artistic achievement, a great Ulster novel. Um, and it... it and he, he, it too kind of suggests that you know, he delve, doesn't delve too deeply into political matters. And I think that's um, partly because he doesn't overemphasize the political kind of themes above the personal themes in the novel itself. But I don't think it means that it's not there. And certainly the screenplay, like the introduction, this story is told against the background of political unrest in a city of Northern Ireland. It's not concerned with the struggle between the law and a legal organisation, but only the conflict in the hearts of the people when they become unexpectedly involved. I think at face value, and this may well have been uh, deliberate just to kind of make sure there was no attempt by the censor to cut down the film. Um, I think the, the key phrase here is not concerned. It's not that it's not, this isn't some sort of, you know, like historical fiction in that sense, you know, I, I think it's being told against the background of political unrest in the city. And I think that it attempts to reflect historical, be historically accurate and what it does with that, but it doesn't ignore it. And I think it's often kind of taken that the film ignores all that when actually, if you look at the historical authenticity of it, it certainly doesn't. I'm just going to look at a few aspects of that historical authenticity now. Um, I, I've kind of covered a lot of this in the Belfast Battalion book, looking at the, the history of the IRA in Belfast between 1920s and 1969. I I kind of looked at this in looking for various, there aren't actually a lot of written memoirs or sources for the period. There's a lot of documents and court reports and there's a lot of newspaper accounts, whatever else. But um, I had found by accident, I'd reread the novel and realized that it was much more accurate than I'd thought. And I think in that sense, it does give us um, it's kind of it's it's almost a primary source for the period in that sense. And it gives some of the surviving memoirs do give a hint of how the accuracy of Green's depictions that aren't all, like I say, aren't always explicit. And one is this idea that Green refers to the IRA as the organization and never uses uh, the IRA is a term, but if you look at the, the the speech patterns and the way people use the organization in the novel and in the film, and you look at contemporary memoirs and oral histories like Uncle McKeown's biography of Harry White, which is called Harry, and his IRA in the Twilight Years, where uh, members of the IRA continually refer to it as the army, 
And if you look at phrases that they use in the memoirs and you just simply drop army into the, the, the dialogue in, in the novel and the film, you realize that Green actually is very closely mirroring the, the way people did actually talk um, within the IRA when they were referring to the organization itself. Another area, um, one of the really revealing areas, is in the depiction of the structure of the IRA. Now, ordinarily the IRA has a chief of staff that's resident in Dublin, and this you know, is from, you know, from 1917-18 onwards. And, and I think there are only a small number of periods in which that wasn't the case. And one of them is mid-1942 to November 1942, and then again from January 1943. To November of 1943 in the period just before Green is writing the novel and typically the IRA's adjutant in general which is kind of its uh, second command um, or sort of administrative head was also mainly based in Belfast from September 1942 until June 1943 and these are you know this is in the media um, period before Green writing the men mainly fill these roles. I'm, I'm just going to kind of very note briefly. Their biogra- There's a number of them there whose biographies are very similar to a lot of Johnny's, particularly Hugh McAteer and Jimmy Steele. Um, another, Liam Burke, again, quite similar. And another candidate would be Seamus Rocky Burns, who was the leader of the IRA in Belfast in 19, February 1944, when he was shot dead by the RUC during the time when Green is actually writing his novel. Um, but Given the Greens started earlier, I think it's unlikely that Burns may well have kind of loved it. like obviously the Johnny character and other characters are, you know, some of them are composites maybe of some of these rather than being directly kind of, you know, intended to depict any of them. Um, Hugh McAteer is an obvious inspiration for Johnny and that he'd spent long years in prison. He was actually chief staff of the IRA and he's based in Belfast in this period just before um, Green was writing the novel and into the period when he started writing the novel. Um, he also spent a period of time living in a safe house which was owned by a Protestant family on the Shankill Road um, and well that would have been common knowledge at the time um, I wouldn't really think but I mean it's certainly it, it, it's a device that has worked its way into the uh, novel. Jimmy Steele uh, is another like McAteer who'd spent been in prison for a considerable period of time had escaped. He was head of the Belfast IRA at the time in 19, early 1943. He was rearrested later on and he'd also become the IRA's adjutant general which is kind of McAteer's second in command in April 1943. And another kind of potential sort of source that um, Green drew on in terms of uh, his kind of profile of Johnny is Liam Burke, who had also been IRA adjutant general, was an escapee, hadn't spent as long in prison, but he, he also was arrested in the house of a Protestant family in the village district of Belfast. Um, there also other ways you can illustrate the kind of impoverished nature of that the IRA in the 1940s in Belfast. Um, this is uh, you, you can actually go and find some of these in, in the public records office in Prony. Um, this is the IRA's newspaper, the Republican News. Um, this is a July 1943 edition. It's typed on wax paper. It's cyclist styled on the fold scap and folded over. It's very kind of flimsy and you know it kind of it has the look and feel of that impoverished IRA the chimes with the depiction in Green's novel and at the same time possession of a copy of this could incur a fine or a prison sentence of a month or three months so I mean it has even though for all its flimsiness it has a, a peculiar danger that, that comes with it and the depiction of like McAteer or the Johnny character obviously in the novel uh, sitting writing reports and writing memos you can again find some of these some of Hugh McAteer's actually that were captured in various people um, and so that there's a, a an, an authentic element to the way Green presents this picture which may have kind of been given it a kind of 
sort of realist uh, kind of um, aspect that we maybe have, have underappreciated up to now. Um, similarly, Green's depiction of female activists is very much accurate to the way they're presented in kind of contemporary memoirs and sources. I mean, female activists are portrayed as being inside the organization or you know, the IRA, attending meetings and with access to information, but not formally members. And that's very much the way it was at the time. And you can even kind of mirror uh, the Agnes Kathleen character is described as had she been a man, she would have been on staff with Johnny and himself. You can find like a memo from Jimmy Steele from March 1943 talking about Cassie O'Hara, who's a kind of prominent female Republican activist, saying, I, I may can tell you candidly that I would rather have discussed the matter with Cassie than with some of my staff colleagues. So, you know, this is a there's again, there's a, a kind of authentic element to this depiction by Green. And you can find other incidents that at some level Green may, may have been conscious of that he utilised in the film. And one of them is the Teresa character that appears in the novel and the film. Obviously, I found a 1937 incident and when a Mrs. Teresa White, right, who's a widow who owns a shop on Quadrant Street in Belfast, reports she showed like three men check in her door then drawing revolvers and firing a shot in her house. And in court, uh, she'd said that there'd been ill feeling against her in the district and seven people had called her informer when, when she passed them on the street. But she can't understand this as I never pried into their business. Now, I mean, this, the, even this sort of the language, you never has the sound of the Teresa character in the film. And I, I, I just can't believe that it's completely incidental with, given the similarity of the first names. Similarly, um, Green is kind of the key scene at the start, which is the robbery. Um, the IRA had been involved in various robberies in Belfast in the late 30s, early 1940s. Um, and in the, in the novel, it's to obtain funds for the organization, is the kind of term it's used. Um, and while there have been a number of robberies, like particularly one of an ARP office in Academy Street, where there'd been, uh, there had been shots fired and whatever else, during the period that Green's writing the novel, there's a, a, a robbery of a payroll at Clonard Mill on a Dessa Street in which an REC constable, Patrick McCarthy, is shot dead. And uh, these are the kind of, uh, these are the episodes that clearly uh, Green's drawn upon um, when he's kind of writing the, the robbery at the start, though. Um, you know, again, with all the I mean, there's a mixture of elements that are in some of the different incidents that it or worked into the, the actual episode that was portrayed in the novel and the film. But um, and it's kind of interesting though that in the screenplay it elaborates on this, you know, why they're obtaining funds for the organization and the in internal IRA memos and documents at the time that uh, it was part of the IRA's kind of you know own sort of identity or sense of its own identity was in support and independence of internees. I mean, all our organizations like the Green Cross did that as well. Um, and there were significant numbers of internees. And you can work out from the money that was allocated to internees dependence, how much money the IRA was actually using up during like 1940, 41, 42. And you can then see when they carry out robberies and amount that's robbed the interval until the next attempt to carry out a major kind of fundraising kind of uh, robbery or whatever like that and I think the green then seems to understand this because in the screenplay it elaborates that you know it talks about how there's no more robberies till your man's out of prison I've spent one months planning this raid to get the funds that we need from warring and the others and so um, and again I don't think there's an attempt here to somehow you know to, to kind of morally equivocate over the robberies or the violence associated with them. I think this is more to do with the historical authenticity in terms of what the purpose of them was so that, again, Green's different audiences that they would maybe understand this um, more than than is maybe a, has been explicit since then. You can see this even at the time that you know there, there's a, a prominent prisoner release campaigns in 19 by 1946 
when the screenplay is being written and you know, before the film is released. And this is the support of like local authorities and there's quite a mainstream campaign, particularly in the South. And that's um, maybe why it's more explicit in the screenplay than it was in the original novel. But I think that this uh, kind of historical shift, you can see this direction of travel clearly between the film and the novel. Um, when the novel's published in 1945, like the, Johnny is clearly the, the chief of staff of the IRA because it says so, and that he's, and he's based in Belfast. But by the time the screenplay, James Mason's Johnny, character Johnny is saying, I'm leader of the organization in this city, you know, not chief of staff. And says, I've spent months planning this raid to get the funds, etc. I've got my orders and I'll see them through. So he's clearly no longer chief of staff and no longer, you know, the person giving the orders. And that's, you know, I mean, it's a subtle shift, but it, it mirrors a historical reality. And so we can't kind of dismiss all of these as being purely coincidental. I mean, from March 1945, the IRA relocated its sort of central command, to, uh, such as it was, back to Dublin. Um, it's unclear how far that would have been common knowledge at the time. So, I mean, Green clearly has access to people with a knowledge of events and politics that goes beyond just what's in the kind of, you know, contemporary press. And also there's an element of this which maybe is kind of significant from the point of view of having kind of done a history of the IRA, the IRA in Belfast in the 20s, 1960s, and the Belfast Dublin dynamic is really significant in terms of internal IRA politics and conflicts within the IRA over direction strategy. And this is a long, long running theme. I mean, it's, um, and it's subtle, but it kind of, you know, it riffs off this issue of, you know, um, who's in charge and where they're based. And one other element of the, the screenplay is this idea and this kind of speech that Johnny gives about, I believe in everything we're doing, but violence is getting us nowhere in prison. You have time to think. And if only we could throw the guns away, make our cause in the parliaments. Um, I think this kind of flags one of what I think is probably one of Green's connections to that kind of um, political insight that You've Clan Pavlukta, which is um, Sean McBride, later a Nobel Laureate winner, who's a former IRA chief of staff and son of Major John McBride, who actually went to Schoon's Malachies in Belfast, um, who'd been executed after the 1916 rising. Um, he, his clan, the Pavlukta political vehicle, was formed in July 1946. And that kind of sentiment that Johnny makes in the film kind of very much mirrors some of the kind of political intent um, in Clan the Public. And I mean, McBride was very much still mapped into what was going on in the IRA earlier in the 1940s. But one of the key figures, and this is um, on the right hand side of the screen, you can see Campbell's Snackery, which was uh, opposite City Hall, Belfast, I mean, building, things no longer there now. But, um, Campbell's was the sort of, uh, you know, it was the go to place for the Belfast arts and liter literary and kind of political kind of, you know, commentariat, I think you call them today. Um, and that was, you know, like William Connor, Joseph Tumulty, Dennis Ireland, Sam Hannah Bell, I'm sure John Hewitts and everyone else in this world are all kind of, you know, this is the kind of network that they're all connected into. But Dennis Ireland is kind of significant figure in this group. And you can see Dennis Ireland and and Green involved in literary events and whatever um, in the late 30s, early 1940s. Uh, I mean, that this is, you know, even like there's references to like the young Ian Paisley arriving in Belfast to go to Candles to kind of, you know, uh, mingle with this kind of crowd. So, I mean, it, it, it is very much, uh, you know, it's a sort of, um, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure what the current analogy, I'm sure people who go to Sunflower think it's the I'm sure. Uh, you know, there's plenty of places to imagine that that's they're the kind of same, you know, kind of glitterati or the kind of political literary world. But uh, this that was the network that Green was dialed into. Um, Dennis Ireland, as I mentioned, is the I think the link here. 
Um, he founded the Ulster Union Club, which despite the name is actually a debating group to attract Protestants, the Irish Republicanism. And in, in itself, it became a source of IRA recruits, people like John Graham, um, who's a very prominent uh, um, member of the IRA um, 1940s. Um, and went on after his release to become a golf and international. Um, he's kind of Graham's an interesting figure in his own right. <coughs> but uh, Dennis Arnon became a clan the public, the senator. And I, I think that he may well have been, he may well have had insights that Graham was able to use to understand what was going on within the IRA and to present this, this shift in kind of historical authenticity even between the novel and the film. And I think in overall terms, Green's allusion to the dramas that are going on here doesn't sit easily with the frequent claim that the film in particular completely depoliticized its theme. And ironically, because I'm going to look, show you briefly some of the reactions to the film, Johnny's objectification throughout the film and his ability to be present and unable to influence events around him is actually a pretty accurate metaphor for the IRA of the mid 1940s and late 1940s. So, I mean, it's kind of ironic that, you know, I think he had politicized it and I think that was actually his kind of, you know, the, the sort of general metaphor that he's using there. And even down to in the film, Agnes Kathleen character who you know, involved in, uh, in Johnny's death. I think, I mean, Kathleen Lee Hull and this kind of, you know, mythologized personification of Ireland. I don't think that that's accidental, you know, and I think that that's, you know, the idea that uh, kind of the IRA has been kind of ground down into nothing is being depicted as being done because, I mean, certainly Devil Earth, Fianna Fáil government, um, I mean, the re it, his Justice Minister Jerry Bowden referred to this period as the Second Civil War. And when Anthony McKeown wrote the history of it, I mean, he describes it as the twilight years. You know, it's been kind of the IRA has been kind of almost wiped out in kind of political uh, sense and, and I mean, obviously in the military sense, it has very little kind of substance to it. But that's, uh, you, know, you know, I think that's actually the metaphor, the green, um, a metaphor, sorry, the green is reaching for. And the but I mean, it's as, I, I think, you know, there, like I've mentioned, you know, that, that authenticity and attention to detail, it's just evident all the way through the novel and subtle narrative shifts between the novel and the screenplay. And this is, you know, what Green called the dramas that are going on here. But now I'm going to look briefly at some of the reactions to the film. Uh, the film shown first in the classic cinema in Belfast, due to own uh, Wellington Place. And there was a row over the RUC guard in the cinema. I think the cinema owner was called McDermott, a guy called McDermott. And he actually was claimed that he should be having to pay for it because the RUC guard was getting a huge amount of attention to the film. Um, the Unionist government tried to be kind of aloof from the film. Uh, they, uh, there was supposed to be a screening with um, government ministers and Green that was uh, had to be cancelled due to petrol shortages. I mean, this, this film is being shown in the centre of Belfast. So, you know, it's not really a has that feeling of a pretext to just not do it rather than uh, a kind of real um, explanation. Um, you have various interests and letters. I mean, this is a one from a Bangor picture gore, which has that really kind of contemporary air of a phone caller to the Nolan show, you know, um, talking about, you know, it says, Dear Sir, please grant me a small space in your paper to say how disappointed and disgusted I was with Old Man Out. I've seen an average of five films a week for this last 10 years, and I think it's one of the worst. Why do they have to boost up a bad film? Now, this gets particularly bad. Why do they have to say Kathleen Rand is one of Ireland's most beautiful girls? She may be able to act, but no, not even good looking. Or did they just make her haggard looking for this film? The only person who stole the film was the kid who kept asking for pennies. This last year, people in Belfast kept telling me about scenes shot in Belfast, but I failed to see any. The scenery was unreal, even the Albert. And do our trams really look like this? If so, the English people must have a good laugh. No, Mr. Mason, this is not your best film. It is your worst, yours truly, Bangor Picture War. And the roller reactions kind of, some of them actually ex referencing back to the, that letter in the Northern Whig, you know, saying that 
you know, Banger Picture Goes expressed the opinion of a large majority that this was indeed a very ordinary film and it cast a reflection on the average citizen's living conditions or transport system and the Ulster dialect and the shots of Belfast are a complete frame up, you know. But it's the disappointing and disgusted I mean, it's clearly, you know, there's a slightly over top reaction there. Now, the reaction in Dublin, this is Bertie Smiley. Uh, in the Irishman's diary in the Irish Times saying that there's no doubt that it's a really good film but equally no doubt in essence amounts to the glorification of the IRA. If I'd been a youth emerging from the Theatre Royal on Sunday night and saw on the walls of Trinity College the slogan join the IRA I've not the least doubt that I should have been sorely tempted to do so. Again I think a lot of this speaks to a contemporary audience seeing you know, a, a kind of authenticity or a kind of you know political element of the film that has often been subsequently denied or claimed is not really a prominent issue. Um, and some, I mean, this is uh, Patrick Hannan, who's a demon deck soldier from Barrack Street in Belfast, during a show in the Alhambra Theatre North Street. At one point uh, during the screening, <laughs> Hannan shouts, up the Republic. And he ends up you know, he's being arrested and he gets arrested and gets uh, um, gets himself a month in prison. Uh, but the, the, there's a, a, a kind of um, up the republics is phrase that's used by a lot of Republican prisoners um, when they're convicted in courts. Um, and the, at the time, you know, the kind of typically feature in court reports. And uh, it's just um, it just shows that there wasn't, you know, people didn't see it as some sort of depoliticized piece of art you know they kind of saw it as being very much political and even more so the anti-partition league which issued uh at screenings in england now the anti-partition league was an irish kind of uh union in ireland kind of political pressure group um that sought to end partition and like it at london birmingham manchester liverpool rotherham cardiff it handed out leaflets uh, and Belfast Newsletter helpfully actually published text the leaflet which meant that even though in Belfast they weren't doing it you could actually read what their leaflets were saying it's kind of an interesting bit of um, political gymnastics by the newsletter to publish the leaflet which you know the newsletter very unionist paper in the 1940s so it's kind of a bit odd that they actually carried the text but um, but it it sought to make political capital out of the film and I mean it even talks about you know that uh, the conditions that the film depicts and shows says that the, those conditions are the direct result of the partition of Ireland and the activities of government in the northeastern counties which can only be described as the most fascist in Europe today. A government which spurns the most elementary rights of minorities such as the right to work, the right to vote and the right to civil and religious freedoms. Um, it's you can read that on the rest of the text that on screen it's actually quite interesting as well because that that anti-partition league leaflet's quite revealing about you know the the a lot of the what well, the substance of civil rights campaign in the 1960s had actually been elements of republican campaigns in the 40s and 50s in terms of you know kind of some of the literature they were putting out and some of the kind of uh, political material and the odd thing about that is that uh, I think it's only when the Catholic middle class adopt that in the 1960s that it becomes a mainstream civil rights campaign and you can kind of read I mean there's a very contemporary feel to so much of the reactions and the the, the language around uh, all man out in the 1940s it's you know it, it is worth spending a bit more time looking at it and Another example here is Brant Faulkner, the other Prime Minister in Northern Ireland. Uh, he was uh, in, uh, at the 12th of July in 1947. Uh, he was uh, criticised films with a Roman Catholic bias, such as the Song of Bernadette, or you know, this is the show of films like this, um, because in that case the priest was portrayed as a benevolent benefactor and he had an Irish accent. Um, and he also the the old man out and um, was claimed it was being used as propaganda by anti partitionists which you know as we've just seen is true and that there was a chance that many millions of english people who had never been in ulster would believe the the anti partitionists and what they said about the film you know so i mean it did attract um quite extreme political um reactions 
Um, and it also attracted a copycat novel, a book called The Sigh for a Drumbeat. Um, this kind of, you know, take it took it was by uh, Patrick Doncaster, which is believed to be a pseudonym. pseudonym. Um, and it's you know, it, it has the same basic, you know, it's an IRA leader, and you know, uh, there's a kind of love interest in it, and there's a killing in the book. Um, there's a a romance between a soldier and an IRA, the sister of an IRA leader and whatever else. And there's even, um, <laughs> there's a, it's, and, and, and you can see the Belfast Telegraph suggests, as a political balance of an unreal gunman of another kind, presumably meaning not another kind that's opposite the IRA, which presumably meant to be unionist of some sort, who removes members of the organisation on the instructions of British military intelligence officers. Again, it's just very, interesting to see all this kind of you know as being like fictional devices in the 1940s whatever else i haven't read a side for a drumbeat though i have actually tracked down a copy so i'm hoping to read it um sometime soon but uh, i think that's um that's all i'm going to say about old man out about the novel and and film and green's kind of overall canvas of belfast um i think it's do see it as having historical authenticity and value beyond the kind of um, you know the kind of broader kind of context in which put in, which is cinematography and Carol Reed's Reed's film, um, and I think it is worth revisiting on that basis. And I think particularly um, the the elements of it are, that are written for I think for a Belfast audience. And Belfast audience to understand in a general one rather than I mean obviously there's the arts community in Belfast there are their own in jokes and everything else that are in the film as well and in the novel so uh, it is I mean uh, overall it's the whole thing is worth revisiting so um, thanks for listening